one opportunity. Navigating their future. A set of entrepreneurs work against the tide. Only a few barriers stand in their way. I've met them. Um, honestly, I don't feel that threatened. Meeting new people, obviously just helping to develop my business. A lot to take away from it and think about for the next few days. It'd be really great to win. I mean, all the benefits and the money as well that you get with it would be a huge, huge help in really growing my business. It would mean that it could literally go to the next stage. Oh, it's great. It's really good to collaborate with everyone. It would be a complete life changer. Welcome to Young Startup Talents 2016. <laughs>On Tuesday the 5th of July 2016, a total of 10 successful applicants attended the Young Startup Talent semi-final held at Fairham Innovation Centre. The evening was set out to put the young entrepreneurs all aged between 16 and 25 through their paces. Judges and sponsors from the local area gathered together in a bid to whittle the promising pitches down to a final five. Three months on from the semi-final, five aspiring entrepreneurs have been carefully selected and are now about to pitch in front of the Solent business community. Joining the panel for the 2016 process is a man passionate about his community within the Solent. Appointed Managing Director in 2010, he has a vast background developing businesses and now heads up to 20 centres with over 900 companies. Managing Director of Oxford Innovation, Chris Arlington. A welcomed addition to the team is an individual with a wealth of knowledge and experience in a range of different industries. With over eight years experience, he has worked with a variety of different businesses and now works with companies with a turnover of millions. Relationship manager of NatWest, Simon Finch. Developing strong links with local and national media, she has a range of knowledge in numerous sectors with a passion for helping young entrepreneurs. Managing director of PR company, Media World Waves, and founding partner of Young Startup Talent, Lorraine Nugent. Proudly coming board as a non-executive director of Young Startup Talents is a 17-year-old award-winning tech entrepreneur who houses a workforce of 15. Having recently been named by Richard Branson as one of the most exciting entrepreneurs in the UK and placed as number one on the Times Super Team Power List, director of Social Marley and Towers. With a career spanning more than 25 years, here is an individual with an invaluable reputation within the accountancy sector. He has a vast portfolio within the industry, alongside personal and professional achievements to match. Partner of Hawkins Kennedy Chartered Accountants, Zara Hogg. Stepping up onto the Solent panel for 2016 is a successful individual with over 30 years experience in the industry. Specialising in a broad array of corporate matters, including mergers and startups, he leads high value clients and transactions. Chairman of Verisona Law, Michael Dyer. With years of experience building up his award-winning design and marketing print agency in the southeast, he aims to use his wealth of knowledge to find the next generation of young entrepreneurs. CEO of Creative Pod and co-founder of Young Startup Talents, Matt Turner. Making their way to pitch first, is an entrepreneur who is looking to bring his concept to life. During the semi-final, Calvin wowed the judges with his medical app, which allows users to view their medical health. His detailed plan and vision allowed him to progress to the final. I'm apprehensive, really looking forward to kind of meeting some of the judges, seeing what questions they have for my business plan. With strong competition in the app market, can Calvin rise up and prove his concept? Hello judges, my name is Calvin McLeod. I'm the owner of Wildfire Beacon Productions and uh, the creator of the product Life Beacon. What Life Beacon is, is a medical storage application as well as an identification system <coughs> and a delivery to respondent system. Users will download it from either Android or iOS store and then populate the 
application with their medical history, their emergency contacts, uh, information about their emergency contacts, such as uh, the times they work, where they live. Once users have populated the database with all of their medical information, they then can go in through the settings and set different privacies. So once uh, the users have set their privacy settings, they're then given a, a life beacon. These are the key fob size um, beacons that you have in front of you. They're lightweight, waterproof. Uh, they have the ability to broadcast um, upwards of 20 meters. And what these are, these are identification tags. So the user then puts the tag into their pocket and carries it round as if they would with any other key ring on their keys. If the user should suffer an emergency, any member of the public can uh, approach the person, use their mobile device to scan and receive the signal. The signal has in it a unique identifier, which is then referenced in the database, and depending on the um, level, level of authorization that the respondent has, they are pushed the relevant information. So as a member of the public, if I find somebody in distress, I use my device, I scan them, I get their maybe brief overview of their medic uh, medical history, so maybe they're diabetic, and then maybe an emergency contact and a phone number. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. How is it different to like the health app on your phone? So the health app, not only is it limited in the information it stores, uh, the data it produces and its general use, um, it doesn't have day-to-day -day functions like calendars and reminders or anything like that. But that phone, uh, I mean, we all know iPhones to be unreliable with battery capacity. The screens are vulnerable glass, which if you're somebody who's just been in an accident, is likely going to smash and break. What I'm concerned about is I put all my medical history on, I put everything on, and I could be going out in the evening and some person could sit in a bush with, with a makeshift receiver and get every single person's details and just like, physically sit there and build up a database of everybody in the area. If you have information that you find too critical, save it for your private network, save it for professionals. The public information, however, is going to be very brief overviews. It's going to be the sort of things that if you do have a condition, it's going to be things that could possibly save your life, but might not add any value to the person who's collecting it. I'm missing where you're going with this in terms of a whole raft of different, perhaps, opportunities. Where's the focus for this and how are you going to take it to the market, to that market? The first thing for us to develop would be to develop that initial system and then take it to trials in care homes. I'm currently trying to secure one at a, a school for disabled students. So the first thing for us to do really is develop the foundation system and then trial it in some case studies in some areas. I'm trying to look at your financials and I'm trying to understand how you actually get your money. Okay. Like who pays for what? At the moment, the application is going to um, be free, but a subscription for public users is going to need to be charged so that I can um, host the data and afford to kind of um, work the application. Um, the beacons for public users will be bought by themselves, and beacons for private users will be bought by. Uh, the establishment, whoever it may be, the university, the care home. Do you think £7,700 is enough for marketing? Um, when I don't have a product at the moment that I can really take to market, um, yeah, I mean, I'm struggling with the financial. This is why I'm kind of in the competition. It's for the network of people to help me with that. I've designed a product and now I want investment and an infrastructure to help develop it as a business. What if you advertise, for example, everyone with diabetes, Diabetes UK could come to you and say, we've got this new book about how to handle type 2 diabetes. They pay you and you push it out to everyone with diabetes. So it's keeping it medical yeah. and it's relevant because I've got this app for my medical reasons and I'm now going to learn more about ways I could improve. Yeah, it's definitely something um, to consider. OK, thank you, Kelvin. Thank you. Thank you. Hoping to combine a traditional barber shop with a modern and contemporary twist is barber and businessman Harry Phelan. Throughout the speed networking stage, Harry had the team hooked on his modern take, proving his concept can and does work. 
His drive and passion is clear to see. Will this be enough to get the backing of the judges? I really don't know what to expect. It would be a complete life changer. Of course, I still have a slight nerve about this evening, but I'm feeling very confident. Let's see if he's up to the grade. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harry Phelan, and I'm the proud owner of Studio H, which is my barber shop that I'm currently running from a spare room in my parents' house. I passionately believe in great quality hair, and I'm never satisfied until this has been achieved. Ever since I was a boy, I've believed in this philosophy, and this is what has pushed me all of my life. Not only do I know who's in my chair, but I feel a strong sense of connection with each of my regulars. I'm wanting to create a traditional men's barber shop, but with a modern twist. This being the shop's atmosphere and image and the cutting and shaving services provided. With the old school feel, but with a modern touch. An access of booking an appointment online rather than waiting in shop all day, but still offering this on certain days. I've managed my own business for three years with continuous growth. I've had barbers interested in working alongside me but I found this difficult to achieve as my shop is not currently a fully working barber shop and I don't have the room to allow for students or barbers. I started my career at one of the best salons in my town for five years, which taught me the highest standards of how the environment in shop should be, such as not talking about your weekend or your next holiday, but focusing your time and energy on your client's hair and well-being. I'm currently working at Academy No. 5, teaching Level 2 Barbering, which has interested my passion with the educational side of the business. The main source of income for the business for the first year would be the barbershop. But if I were to win this competition, I would be able to focus more time on the academy side of things. The reason I'll be renting a chair out for the first year is to keep my overheads down and to find potential business partners and a team to work alongside. The reason why you should invest not only your money and your time in myself and Studio H is because I'm young and enthusiastic in the industry and I want to make a difference, not only in my local area and trade, but with my life. What you're saying you're doing, barbers do, but I don't understand what is your killer difference. I've found within my area, especially within a 10 mile radius, that there aren't as many traditional barber shops offering the skill sets that I'm, I want to provide. Is that because there's not the demand? I think that, that there's no one who's grabbed onto the niche of it with the amount of new housing in the area that's being developed at the moment. Most hairdressers these days are unisex. Absolutely. So gents go to ladies' hairdressers to have their hair done too. Why would they go to a barber's rather than the hairdresser? What I've found in the eight years of being in this industry is that men do, did like the idea of going into the salon. It was quite cool to read a trendy magazine and to have a nice refreshment and even a head massage, of course. But learning that a lot of men don't actually like this very feminine environment and also learning that a lot of guys feel like they're the in-between the partner's colour cut rather than being the key attention. That's why I want to go down the traditional side of a barber shop. It's branded as unisex. Is it, is it predominantly aimed at males? When I left the salon, I was doing men and women's hair because I'd learnt both, but I found that I wasn't doing as much traditional cutting, using more clipper work. I started pushing myself and put myself on a course with the Scoran barbers in Rotterdam, the scumbag barbers of the Netherlands, and they taught me the traditional ways of cutting and how a traditional barber shop should run. Can you earn as much money barbering? Is it a rate per hour thing? Do you do a men's haircut faster than a woman's? Typically? Yes, definitely. You can, the thing is with a woman's haircut, where I think I personally struggled when I moved out of the high-end salon in my town to cutting hair out of, the, out of a spare room in my house, I was too scared to charge the prices that they were charging in salon. I could do one woman's hair cut and colour in three hours and maybe charge 60, 70, 80 pounds if I was lucky, or I could get six gents in, 15 pound a cut, 30 minutes per haircut. When you say you're going to, you, you want to go from 15 to 20 pound per cut, mm -hmm. how many customers do you think will drop out for that five pound increase? As you can see in the pictures of my two shops that I had, I went from upstairs to downstairs. When I'd done this change, I went from £10 a haircut to £15 a haircut. And all I noticed was my haircuts went an extra two weeks. I've worked out roughly if I can get my haircuts to rebook on the promotion of every 3.3 weeks, I will always stay busy. So how many roughly customers do you have at the moment? Roughly at the moment, I think I'm getting close to about 300 customers. Is that 300 customers per how long? I roughly do about... 30 to 50 a week at the moment. 30 to 50 a week. So if you know that they order every 3.3 weeks, why don't you get your customers to put you on retainer and say, right, direct debit, 
25 quid a month and you can turn up once a month for a haircut. And suddenly do a membership? Yeah. Yeah, I would love to push into this. I think that would be great. I've seen quite a few club, bigger barber shops, especially ones in like Marbella, who are, who are doing this. But I just think at the moment, with my clientele, I don't want to scare anyone away with prices. Very good. Okay. Very All good. right, okay. Thank you, Harry. Cheers, cool. Harry. Next to Pitch is a talented young entrepreneur who is passionate about his mobile network, One Beyond. Casper is looking to break free into the market and prove his concepts. During the semi-final, he proved that he had the enthusiasm, commitment and drive throughout. With over five years experience in sales and marketing, Casper has the experience needed to get his business off the ground. Submitted my business idea and here I am. I found it very good. It's quite interesting to see what's going to happen tonight. I'm quite confident, quite happy about it. Hi guys, my name is Casper, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my mobile company called One Beyond. So One Beyond is the new mobile network in the UK, which is focused on simplicity, low cost, and being customer centric. Our target audience over the longer term is basically everybody who has a smartphone. In the more immediate terms, which is the next six to nine months, our target audience is 35 to 55 year olds. So over a the five year period, we're looking to gain 2 million active subscribers, be synonymous with great customer service, and then either exit the market through a sell to a host network or a brand, or expand into EU and worldwide. On the shorter term, we're looking right now to get three, 200 to 300 subscribers, which will build our foundation for utilization statistics essentially to see how much of the bundles the customers have that they use. And we can then use that to calculate our exact profitability and scalability to then go out and secure an investment. Market research has shown that shorter term contracts are increasing in populari popularity, primarily because smartphone prices are going down. It's both with the younger and the older segments. And research also showed that 25 pound a month is the pain threshold for pricing after that point, consumers expect a handset to be included. So we're staying below that until we can start offering handsets. Our differentiation at the moment lies in a good story, low price and great coverage and great service. That is it at the moment. We are quite small and we've gone to market with something where we'd normally have to pay £100,000 to have the pri privilege of being called an MBNO. Tell us about how are you going, what I don't understand is yeah. how are you going to get these customers to transfer? Without any PR or marketing? With, yeah. This is with no PR or marketing? Well, we will, we will do PR marketing, but I need to go in the right way without then, spend, but wasting too much money. But if you're going to do PR do? marketing, you can't present those figures because they're wrong. They're fundamentally wrong because you haven't got PR or marketing. No, what, so they, what, said what, you're, what, that, you're what that channel assumes is direct marketing. I don't need everybody to turn. So what, we, what I've done with uh, the direct marketing telesales, which granted needs some more quantity to actually be effective, but then I've also said that. Uh, we've targeted people who are with one of the big four companies and pay a lot. So price, show that price has shown that that was the overall factor for people switching, followed by network uh, ex extent. At the moment, it looks like you're not going to accept direct debits. That, that comes in phase... At the very moment, yes. Phase, between phase and one and three. So I don't think you're going to get many people that will sign up for a mobile phone today. It, it's going to be the same as if you went to Amazon and bought something. You type in your card number and you order. It'll be a recurring charge from your card. It's exactly the same function right, as direct okay. debit. We will work in direct debit, but that would require us to have trading history. Yeah. So that's why. We don't need everybody to sign up in the first six months. We just need two to three hundred to actually get to do the base. We don't need the whole world to sign up, we just need the base. I've had things charged to my card before that I didn't know were going to be charged to my card because I hadn't realised I'd got into this agreement. And, it's, and it takes a little bit of tracking down to actually be able to stop that payment being made. Just explain to me, where are you going to get, on your own numbers, £831,000 worth of working capital from? So there's a case study in that one on page, I believe it's page 9. But it shows basically how this has been done in, an, in a less favourable market. It's not going to work because you need to have the infrastructure in place to be able to get two million customers. It's like, it's yeah. like, it's like saying, oh, well, I, I don't need the, the capital to start my so restaurant until I get diners in it. So the, the new wholesale platform, uh, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear on this. Um, the, new wholesale, the new wholesale agreement, the new platform with the billing CRM and rating in engine that we'll use, everything is identified and ready. We just have a, it costs money to start. 
which exactly. I don't play. Yes, so once we've gone out, actually proven the, the, proven the business model, and then gone in and set. But don't you need that platform to, to use that platform to initiate the business yeah, model? Yeah, you're in a catch 22 no, we situation. Are, we, already, we already have a platform. We already have, have a platform so now. So you can have customers. Yes, but we're live. if you went out and you were disruptive and you said 9.99, all you can eat, all inclusive, fill your boots until you're sick, you'll get investment for that. But I, okay, fair. Okay, that, I haven't looked at it that way. You'll get investment for that. It's sexy, it's newsworthy. That's what a PR, PR man Someone would Someone like O2 would buy you out because they'd be scared what you're doing to market. Yep. But you see what happens if it's not well managed in that case. Because you looked at the people's operator who chose the wrong customer service uh, agency, external partners. They chose the wrong platform and they chose the wrong, wrong audience in the beginning. They've lost money continuously. All right, okay. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Next to pitch is a passionate entrepreneur with buckets of enthusiasm. University student John Wheel is looking to impress the judges with his group organization app, Group Hub. During the semi-final stage, John impressed the team who were keen to find out more about his concept and understand the process behind it. So this evening, I'm really looking forward to pitching my idea to the judges and answering their questions really and seeing, you know, what do they think needs improvement. I'm feeling quite excited. You know, I want to get out there now and, and really just pitch my idea. Good evening, I'm John Wheel and I'm the founder and CEO of Group Hub. If you've ever managed a group, club or society, then you'll know that it's time consuming and hard work. If you look at the way many groups are run, it's a disjointed process. You might be storing members' details in Excel spreadsheets, communicating with members via bulk email or Facebook groups, and that's before you even get on to the more complex tasks such as organising meetings and events and taking membership payments. Group Hub is an online space for groups, clubs and societies to manage all aspects of themselves online in one place. And the key here is in one place. Group Hub becomes the single source of truth for both the group managers and also the group members, removing that all too frequent miscommunication. The initial contact with Group Hub is made by the group manager or organiser. They sign up for an account, import their members, and they can quickly communicate with those members, organise meetings and events, and they'll shortly be able to take membership and bill payments online as well. Each group is assigned a unique URL, which the managers can then give to their members. Our market research has shown that privacy is a top priority for groups, and therefore the group has a choice of whether they want the group to be public or private. We have a target of having a minimum of 30 groups with at least 100 members by the beginning of November. Group Hub has a number of potential revenue streams, including a typical software as a service revenue model, a freemium model, a commission model, and also an advertising model. Now, I don't want to explore all of those at the same time. So initially, I'll be trialling a reoccurring revenue model charged at a very simple flat rate of 10 pence per member per month. Very simple, very easy to market. The first 25 members, though, will be free for each group. So they can sign up, they can give it a go. We have a vision that one day Group Hub will be used by every group around the world, all the way from small groups up to large associations. Thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I want to understand your marketing strategy being going into like Parish magazines yep. and things like that. But I would actually say you should look at it a different approach. So could you not go to the national bodies and literally say, we will have all of your clubs, in return for yep. putting all your clubs, we'll give you X amount of commission, but you've then got the kudos because you've been recommended by the people which yep. the club are physically having to listen to, and you're going to get mass users. Or you white label it. Yeah, so, so you go yeah, to yeah. them and the Scouts Association and it's not Group Hub, it's the Scout Hub yeah. and you get whatever plus a penny a member and you know. Yeah. So just to explain both those points, um, one of the issues with going to those large organisations, I've tried speaking to like students unions and things like that, the first question they ask is about, you know, is it well tested, how many groups are using it? So with this approach, I don't want to be going to parish magazines for the rest of my life, I want to be going to these large organisations, um, but I want to sort of get some initial people using it and then I can go to them and say, look, this platform is working. That's, so to answer that question. Beta test. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a quite test bed. Yeah. And then to answer your question about white labelling, that's certainly something that I'd love to do, especially I think that would work well with students' unions and things like that. They could completely brand really they don't know really anything well. about. So have you gone to the university yet and asked them if you could 
Yeah, so I have spoken um, to Portsmouth University Students Union. Um, they were initially a bit like, well, we have already developed something like this themselves, but I actually see that as quite a good thing because it shows that there isn't something already out there. Um, but they were, they were kind of that typical large organisation of we want something that's been well tested. Um, but I think that the fact that I've done a lot of work with the university this year, I'd hope now that they would kind of, you know, see that I'm not just some guy off the street who's just created if something. If you were to consider the investment um, from the competition, what was that, what's that going to be spent on? So the cash price would be spent on marketing. Um, I mean, my primary role at the minute is marketing. From a support point of view, I can handle that myself. Development side, I think developing new bits, I can still handle that myself. So really, it's just about marketing. The spend on that, is it um, going to be through social media, Facebook? Is it going to be TV? What's, what, what are you going to go into? So it will be, it'll be trialling social media. I don't want to say now I'm going to spend exactly this much on social media because it might prove to be that the cost of acquisition is just too high per, per user. Um, so I am looking at attending the uh, TechCrunch Disrupt event in London this, later this year. This could actually work there quite well, something a bit different. Um, and hopefully that would sort of get it out you know, it might not get any m big articles written about it, but at least then sort of major journalists that are there will, will know about it. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you, John. Okay, thanks. That's great. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Really Thank you. Last to step into the final is an entrepreneur with a diverse vision. His experimental lifestyle brand is at the forefront of wearable technology, something never seen before in the young startup talent process. During the semi-final, Ming wow the team, displaying his knowledge and proving his product, innovation and skill. His mission statement is clear to produce wearable tech which doesn't break the bank. Even if it doesn't work out that way, it was like, it's a good experience anyway. I feel like I'm slightly unprepared or forgetting something, so, um, but the rest of it is like excited. So my name is Ming Wu and I'm the director and designer of WU App Design. What we do is uh, wearable technology, but it not in the sense of just technology, it's the w way we present it. So the, presentati the presentation is the freedom of choice, uh, where you got the choice of what kind of technology you want to be using and the choice of the design of your jewellery you want to be using. So what we have here is a range of rings and necklaces and also all types of other jewelries as well. Phase one is all about digital storage. Fa phase one, digital storage in the sense of um, your own work being p personal on you without being att attached to the internet via the cloud or any other ways of, of it being accessed. So this, this kind of type of thing would be on you all the time and in, in here it's, it's stored everything about this business in here currently. So all the business plans, all the designs and the jewellery are currently backed up on here. I have it on hand anywhere in the world. If I'm there, then I can use that information to then carry on my day-to-day. -day. Phase two of the product development is all about wireless tech. So anything from NFCs to RFIDs, then all the functions there are behind it. So high security access cards to anything to, to something that can, when you walk home, that switches on all the lights automatically. All that in something that you can choose, the design, how it functions, and where, is, or where it's worn on the body. Phase three is biomonitoring. That is essentially all the vitals in your body, or most of it that y they c doctors can extract via, say, ECGs, heart rate monitors, and all the other things, in including blood oxygen. So essentially, that is, um, it stores on the device, and when a doctor wants to see it, you can either link it up to your, um, the network that they provide, or you walk into a, um, a medical facility where that links up all that information um, straight away so doctors know how you're doing for a duration of time. So are you saying it's taking readings regularly throughout the day? Yes, it, it, um, it can take readings so depending on it's live. what, yeah, so, and, and that's uh, due to be integrated into the whole ethos of the, the, the company, which is to make technology disappear. What you've just said in just one sentence, I found really interesting, making technology disappear. And for someone who did have to wear a blood pressure monitor for a week, those are the sort of things that suddenly, as people become more aware of blood pressure and O2 levels and heart rate and sugar stats, you know, and we can self-medicate a lot of these things now and take better care of ourselves, I think that's a really interesting angle. Therefore, it should be coming out in your business plan stronger. 
if that's your focus, making technology disappear, shout it loud and shout it proud. I, I definitely agree with the sentiment in around um, the healthcare pers perspective because I think a lot of health wearable products and, and healthcare stuff is designed for function rather this than is the early design. Early for the, the the medical stuff, which is born. Where is it? Where do you wear that? Just here. Just okay, so it can be. Unseen. Well, there's yeah. obviously the sizing differences, yeah. but. All right. <laughs> 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 so what, is the, what does that do, mate? Huh? What does this um, do? This, this th at the moment, there's this um, nothing at all. It's just a. What is it? it is this is uh, for the biomonitoring, so the, the, oh, the right, yeah. heart rate. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, how do we protect security on this? Because oh, that this one is going to be prone to theft and getting into the wrong hands and all that sort of stuff. So so are we encrypting this or? Um, that, that could be an option for the customer in, entirely. If they want to encrypt it, they can do it themselves um, if, they, if they need to do that, because then they have more control over it. Um, what, we, what, what I aim to provide is just the hardware. So the function is there for different interpretations. With the rings and the jewellery, where are you at with it at the moment? As in, um, have you had any interest from people so far to purchase it? Um, Currently, right now, I'm talking to a customer in the US and they found me through um, um, social media. So it's all ready to go then? It's right? all ready to go. It's like what, what is it you're looking to get from this competition, um, if you were to win the competition? So it's almost exactly the same as my university links. It's purely networking and finding the right people to help push this idea into the real world. Yeah, thank you. 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 As we draw closer to the end of another fantastic year within the Solents, the judges must make the difficult decision of selecting just one lucky entrepreneur who will walk away with an incredible £50,000 worth of products and services. Young Startup Talents would like to thank all of the sponsors and supporters and look forward to working with the next set of entrepreneurs in 2017. To find out more about Young Startup Talents, the sponsors involved, and to follow their progress of entrepreneurs past and present, visit youngstartuptalents.co.uk